IndyCar drivers, but if you look inside the cockpit of these machines, it looks something wholly different than anybody has ever seen before. Yeah, it's full of electronics and wiring. Uh, the car has about one and a half miles of wiring on it and uh, all kinds of uh, computing power on board for, to run the different actuators and the different, uh, di different perception sensors. Before we get the autonomous driving competition started, two traditional cars set to take some exhibition laps. This is the Indy Racing Experience two-seat Indy car, which is being piloted today by four-time Indy 500 starter Gabby Chavez, who won the Indy Lights race on the Oval here at IMS back in 2014, the Freedom 100. He was also the Indy Lights champion that year, and he'll be giving a tour to Brad Chambers Chambers, the Indiana Secretary of Commerce, strapped into that back seat, about to take a couple of memorable laps around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yeah, and, and they have just done a great job here in the state of Indiana. Yeah, you're exactly right. What a partner the state has been. And, and without a partner like that, especially one that has a, a pre-existing motorsports community to, to draw from, an event like this couldn't happen. Absolutely. And, and if you look at this, this group that's gathered today, they really had to, to, to figure out how to merge industry, uh, the academic world, and, and also uh, government entities together to make this happen. And they've just done an amazing job making the event happen. They uh, removed any barriers that could have existed. They figured out how to get these teams here uh, so they, they could be successful and just really focus on racing and focus on the vehicles. They've just, just uh, really made it happen for us. In talking to the various teams about the process of replacing the human driver of these cars. They were quantifying basically what a human driver like Gabby Chavez right here has to process in real time and somehow hearing about what a computer has to go through gives me even greater appreciation for the human driver. Yeah, absolutely. We definitely found out that humans are really talented in this process. Uh, you know, you not only have to see the surroundings and process them, but also feel the vehicle you know, know how much traction you have as you're going through the corners. And then, of course, make decisions under really hard, hard, hard circumstances. So if there are other objects in the track or, or other vehicles around, you really need to make sure that you take the right path. And it's a very difficult thing to write up into code. Uh, but these teams have really done it. They took on the task and, and have pulled through. So many crucial partners have ensured that this event could go off without a hitch today. So while Gabby makes this lap around the track, with Brad Chambers. Let's learn just why the Indy Autonomous Challenge is powered by Cisco. Brake check confirmed. Sys state 13, system state 6, CT4. We can successful. Can we set the race condition to two, please? Tell the operation is live. Please set the steering and uh, car is yours. Oil Raceway today in one of the early testing for the Indy Autonomous Challenge. The Indy Autonomous Challenge is a bunch of university teams from around the world competing head-to-head -head in a race like the Indy 500 with no drivers. The car has to think for itself, has to drive for itself. The place where a driver would sit has no spare room whatsoever. They've managed to cram all of the electronics, all the communication, all of the sensors into that space. The LiDAR, the radar, GPS, all these things connect to the Cisco infrastructure. At Cisco, we're here to basically connect all of those bits and pieces together. Cisco switch is booting. Today I am monitoring the Cisco system connectivity as we test the car through the parking lot. It's like a cable through the air at 200 miles an hour. A lot of folks are familiar with, with normal Wi-Fi, but you would not run a high-speed race car where safety is involved across a wireless network like that. So we're running all of that over our ultra-reliable wireless backhaul. We have a ping to the Cisco system. Ultra-reliable wireless backhaul is much more capable of providing really time-sensitive connectivity at, at high bandwidths in a moving environment. Ultra-reliable wireless backhaul naturally lends itself to a lot of really fun places. Being able to use it on a race car, I mean, that's the type of thing I can take home and show to my seven-year-old and he's impressed. It's really exciting for Cisco to be involved with this first-time occurrence of a very high-speed race car. Let these students try out their ideas with autonomous vehicles and do it at a speed level which has never been done before.
in that feature. You got a great look inside the cockpit of these race cars and saw all the technology there crammed in to where a driver would ordinarily sit and featuring prominently with great pride of place was the Luminar LiDAR system, Rob, which is crucial for these uh, Indy Autonomous Challenge cars. Absolutely. There are three of these LiDARs on the vehicle. They send out a, a path of lasers that uh, generates a 3D map around that surrounds the vehicle so they can figure out where the walls are and especially where the objects are in front of them, which you'll see later today. Let's check in with Katie for more on this vehicle down in the pits. And Ryan, one of those people that has been putting in a lot of hours to these cars is Lauren McIntyre with Hunkos Hollinger Racing. Lauren, you're the chief project manager for these Indy Autonomous Challenge cars. What's it like to have to teach a bunch of engineers about racing, which you know so well? Probably equally as challenging as them teaching us about autonomy. So something that is brand new to our world. After what's been five months of a core group of people, it has been awesome. We have learned just as much from them as they've learned from us. And I believe together we'll put on a good show today and everyone's going to be impressed. You've put in a lot of long hours on all of these cars that line pit road right now. What's it like to finally see them on track? Absolutely incredible. Um, five months ago, I don't think any of us saw that this was actually going to be a vision. Through the hard work of the universities and our team at Hooncoast, it's a uh, just unbelievable to be able to see it and I think that this is really just a starting step to what this can be. Well thanks for all the time that you put into these cars we are certainly looking forward to the records that will be set today. Thank you. Thank you. Just amazing technology and of course the chassis provided by the Italian race car manufacturer Delara. This car on track right here is the Delara EXP. The EXP stands for Experience, Experiment, Exponential, and Expertise. The premise behind this machine was, if we could build our dream car with no restraints, what would it be? This is the answer. Driving the car is the CEO of Delara, Andrea Puntramoli, with Austin Russell riding shotgun in this machine. And Austin, as the founder and CEO of Luminar, has also contributed a great deal towards what we're about to see today. Yeah, definitely. Just a huge supporter of the program and, uh, you know, stepped up and, and put their LIDARs in these vehicles. And that's really the uh, one of the primary things that you're going to use today. So. And Rob, your Deep Orange program at Clemson was instrumental in the initial design of these cars that then have gone to their respective universities. What was it like receiving a traditional race car, knowing you're going to have to fit this out to do something that no one had ever done before? It was pretty overwhelming at first. We were a little bit nervous about it, but you know, at the end of the day, we had a great group of faculty, staff, and especially students that stepped up to this super hard challenge of figuring out how to integrate these, these, uh, all of these, you know, technologies into the vehicle, and, and to, that will satisfy what the vision was that that Energy Systems Network put forward for the India Autonomous Challenge, and. Uh, we were just super happy to be involved. You know, it was part of our educational process at Clemson, and uh, we couldn't have asked for a better group of partners that were put together for this uh, for this event. Now, can you put into words the amount of pride you feel seeing these cars on track here at IMS today and all throughout the week, really fulfilling the mission that you set out upon over two years ago? Yeah, it's just unbelievable to think about all the partners that we've worked with. And, you know, we're one one gear in this huge uh, uh, machine that made this happen. And I just, um, it, it was overwhelming, to be honest with you, to see him blasting down the straightaway on, on Thursday and uh, really excited to see what, we, what, what will happen today. And we just uh, couldn't be more proud of the teams and how they've taken what uh, we, we gave them to start with and, and matured it and, and made it into the rocket ship that you're going to see today. Real quick, you've been plugged in with these teams from the beginning. Can you imagine the nerves and the excitement? I'm nervous for them. Uh, I know they're nervous, and uh, you, you'll see it a little bit today. Maybe when they're out there running, you'll have uh, at least one person on the team that's trying to watch and make sure the vehicle is doing what is expected, and they have their finger on the emergency stop. That's the only thing these teams can send to the vehicles while it's running, and you will definitely see that today. But, you know, at the end of the day, they've all been successful already, uh, no matter what they do on the track today. STEM students from all over the state of Indiana are here to take in the Indy Autonomous Challenge. And to kick it off, let's head down to the governor of Indiana, Eric Holcomb. Ladies and gentlemen, start your software and crank your engines.
Motor Speedway, meaning the most famous words in motorsports get a slightly new tweak to them. But these teams, they've been working on these cars all day, and we are about ready to send them loose. Let's run through how this works out. There is at least one scheduled round of competition, and then weather and time permitting, a possible shootout for the top three. But we'll see nine teams participate here in the opening round. Rob, what is the format? So what you'll see first is the, uh, the car will start up on pit lane. Uh, one car at a time is going to go out. They're going to pull out of their pit box and, and uh, make their way onto the track, blending on over uh, on, uh, near the back straightaway. They're going to they're gonna come by the start-finish line the first time, and then they'll do in a complete warm-up lap for one whole other lap. The next time they come to the start-finish line, they'll be uh, going as fast as they can go. Uh, so they'll have two laps at high speed. And the average speed over those two laps is, will be how they'll be scored for that portion. After they complete those two laps, they're going to coast down a little bit down around the back straightaway. They'll stop down in the exit of turn number four. So if the fans can look down to the right. They'll see that. Um, and then they're, we're going to set up some obstacles out on the course. You'll see the, a group from Hunkos out there setting up obstacles that the teams will then have to drive through without stopping. And that's a pretty uh, nerve-wracking thing to watch. You can really see this car sort of thinking as they're driving through there. And uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge to, to pick up those obstacles and, and, make, and avoid them. After they get through the obstacles, they're going to run back around the track at, at a kind of a caution speed, and they have to stop adjacent to their pit stop uh, safely, or their pit stall safely on pit road. And it's worth noting the obstacle avoidance portion, portion of the event. Uh, that is a pass-fail, effectively. There's not yes. a timed element to that event, and confirmation has come down. We will be doing a shootout for the top three. So the crucial thing in this opening round of competition, Rob, is the first car makes its way out onto the speedway. You need to make sure you've dialed in enough speed into your algorithm here to find yourself in the top three because only the fastest three teams will have a shot at that million dollar check. Yeah, what a treat we're gonna see today. Uh, there, right now uh, is Poly Move. It looks like they're rolling off pit lane here. They're gonna they're gonna really be worried about warming up the tires and uh, you know getting the car ready as the tires warm up. They get more traction and allow them to go at, at a higher speed. But yeah, how much risk are you willing to take in this first round? I'm not really sure. Uh, I think uh, when there's a million dollars on the line, you really are gonna send it this first this first uh, this first time around as well. And we'll see what uh, see if we break some records here in this in this. Uh, group of cars. The order is as follows. Polymove out first, followed by Tomb Autonomous Motorsport. So two of the powerhouse teams from Europe going right away to start this competition. Scheduled to go third, Black and Gold Autonomous Racing. Keist from Korea is scheduled to go fourth. Cavalier Autonomous Racing from the University of Virginia will be fifth. AI Racing Tech sixth. Euro Racing seventh. Mid Pit RW eighth and Autonomous Tiger Racing, the ninth and final team, set to take to the track. And there are the nervous faces here on this Polymove team, which is largely made up of students from the uh, University uh, Politecnico di Milano in Italy, with a little bit of help as well from the University of Alabama. Yeah, just an outstanding group of students, and they've really done a great job coming up to speed. They're, they're definitely a uh, contender to, to take home the big check today. Uh, you can see they had a great, just a great launch there off of pit lane, no problems at all. Uh, and they're, now they're heading down the back straightaway, and you can uh, start to see them maybe weave around a little bit to warm up the tires as they're as they're uh, getting up to speed here. Uh, right now, moving about 102 miles an hour, so they're uh, getting after it pretty quickly here. Let's go down to Katie in the pits as the warm-up laps begin. And Ryan, this is one of those teams that you are definitely going to want to keep an eye on today. They won the simulation race earlier this year, which certainly gave them a lot of confidence coming into the Indy Autonomous Challenge here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Well, but then maybe that confidence took a little bit of a hit earlier this week when they spun and practice on Thursday. But when I talked to them yesterday, they said, well, actually, we viewed that spin as a good thing because we were able to find the limit of this car and also find that it can behave just like a human spinning over in turn two on practice on Thursday. They analyzed that data, were able to figure out exactly what went wrong, and they are back here and ready to put down some fast laps here for the Indy Autonomous Challenge. So, Rob, my question to you would be, how beneficial was that spin for this team? 
Well, they certainly found the limits, right? And, and uh, everybody stood back and was pretty impressed. Uh, we all heard the squealing tires and, and we're just happy it didn't hit anything, but they definitely found the, the traction limit. And of course, then we had to make some adjustments based on that. But I think uh, they also found a few other things about how to control the throttle and the steering uh, around this. So the, uh, luckily they went back and made a few changes and uh, are gonna gain speed today because of it. Everybody learned a great deal from that as well. The Hunkos Racing Team made some setup adjustments. Keep in mind, these Bridgestone tires have not been utilized on this Indy Lights chassis prior to this competition. So there's some tire data that goes into this, yeah. plus all the autonomous technology as well. As Poly Move comes out of turn number four, the warm-up lap nearly complete. We'll see our first competitor here looking to put some times on the board. And they're on it. Here comes Polymove, close to the yard of bricks. Their run has begun. About 117 miles an hour through turn one there. You can see they're off the bottom a little bit. Uh, you may not see too many teams run that traditional line right down on the white line today because it, you, you really are weighing risk, right? You don't know uh, if, you, if you lose your, your bearings a little bit or the localization algorithm loses its bearings, you don't want to end up in the grass. And so uh, early on, minimize risk, maybe run a little bit longer line around the track, but, uh, but make sure it comes in safe. But they're really getting after it right here. They just hit over 140, 150 miles an hour now on the back straight. So we're uh, really seeing some uh, pretty impressive uh, run here the team looking at the data in real time at this point there is nothing that they can control their baby is out there sink or swim it's up to the car at this point yeah definitely moving well right now definitely looking good for him hit a top speed of 151 miles per hour down the back stretch keep in mind 112 well 109 110 years ago at the first indianapolis 500 you had to maintain a 75 mile per hour average over a quarter mile to be eligible to participate in that race. Here's the first ever autonomous run officially timed at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and they're hitting speeds up over 150 miles an hour, 120 entering turn one. First lap in the books, an average speed of 122.256 miles per hour. Yeah, what a, what a great job they did right there. Uh, definitely speeding up down the straightaways and slowing down a little bit for the corners, doing exactly what you expect here to, to keep it in the ballpark so that they can survive, hopefully, for that shootout later if they, to, keep this, to keep this going. What do you think the rest of the competitors are thinking after seeing that speed? That's about as fast as we've seen anyone go in practice leading up to the event. Yeah, this is putting up a pretty big, a pretty big mark that uh, the teams are probably uh, having to adjust to right now. And so you're going to see some teams that probably have to dial a little bit more risk into the algorithms and and, uh, and go after it here if they're going to make it into the top three. Through the north end for the final time on this timed run, Poly move through turn number four and roaring towards the start finish line. The first lap again, 122.256 miles per hour. Here comes the Italian team with some help from the University of Alabama across the yard of bricks. And the two lap average, 124.450 miles per hour. That becomes the benchmark time to beat. But it's not time to exhale yet if you're this team because they still need to come around and then the obstacle avoidance portion of the competition. Yeah, when, when, what you just saw was, first of all, completely amazing. Uh, they really, really got after it down the straightaways there. And they were re relying pretty heavily on their GPS systems and, uh, and the inertial measurement uh, units in the, in, the, in the vehicle to guide themselves. Uh, when they come through and have to dodge these obstacles, they're really going to be relying on some of the other sensing systems, the radar, the LIDARs, potentially the cameras as well, looking through here to, to, to look at this. So this really brings out a new portion of the algorithm, and they're going to have to really spend time on, on how to plan. So you'll see the car do this. And again, this is a pass-fail portion, not a timed portion of the event. So the car is supposed to come to a stop here on the front straightaway and then navigate through these obstacles. It's worth noting, you'll see these obstacles placed in different positions, kind of at random. And the idea is to really test that the car is making these decisions in real time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the, you know, they'll probably rely heavily on the LIDAR here. And uh, you, what you may notice is the car will maybe not see them right away, but maybe about you know, 80, 100 meters away or so, they'll start to, to see these obstacles and you'll see this, the car start to react and, and, and try to avoid them. It's a pretty nerve wracking time. Looks like they're rolling. So. Poly move 
back up and running, headed towards the obstacles. And if it can su successfully negotiate those barriers, then the move, the run will essentially be complete pending being able to stop appropri appropriately in their pit box. That looks like a successful run yeah. to me. Yep. So just one last box to check, and that is making it back around under caution speeds. And that also, by the way, is part of this too. The car is receiving effectively the, the state of the track in real time, the flag status, and it has to adjust its behavior accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see if, if you were uh, looking in the in the pit area, they have these coming up on the screens in real time, and it's uh, detecting all the objects around it, and it's trying to plan its path through that, uh, through that set of obstacles. The obstacles are somewhat randomly placed, but the intention is that there's no way you could go straight through it, so you're going to have to make some maneuver. Uh, to get through it safely. Mentioned that this is primarily an Italian team, but embedded with them is a professor from the University of Alabama, Brandon Dixon. And we were told he is there for a very specific reason. He's an amateur road racer and his own ride is raced at in some fairly uh, major amateur racing competitions here in the US and bringing the motorsports aspect to this competition. Not every team has that box checked. They feel like he's a really big asset. Yeah, definitely. He's very switched on when it comes to racing and, and uh, you know, what to look for, how to maybe approach these different problems and, and, and especially, you know, maybe not trying to overthink the problem sometimes, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, he's really a great asset to them. Talking to Sergio Savarese, who is the team lead for Polymove, he felt like this was so important a competition like this one he said back in italy all of the italian manufacturers are watching with great interest not just the technology but the brain power behind these teams yeah and uh yeah, maybe the only thing faster than the cars today are the the way the you know the speed that the resumes are are uh, going out the door and the offers are probably coming back in the door to these teams i mean it's just uh amazing the talent that's generated there have been several hundred students around the world working on this for a couple years it's just uh, amazing Speaking of Sergio, I believe he's standing by now with Katie in the pits. And yes, as you can imagine, there are still some nerves as that car does need to come to the pits and still come to a stop. Sergio, I see you kind of tapping your feet, moving your hands a little. Why are you still so nervous? Well, okay, I'm nervous because it, we were the first. Uh, the, the track is, is, quite, uh, is quite cold, so there were a lot of uncertainties, but uh, so far so good. We are happy of our of our performance and uh, let's see what happens. What does it mean to make the fastest so far autonomous laps here at the historic Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Oh, we're very proud, very proud. We open, uh, we open the door to a new era. And tell me about your students, even you know, watching them just now during those laps, they too seemed very nervous, but at the same time, very confident in each decision that they were making. What has this journey been like with them? Okay, you know, when, when the car goes out, it's, uh, it's an artificial intelligent driver that, uh, that decides everything. So when he's out, you just, in theory, you have to relax and uh, let him go. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Earlier in the week, the first ever 100 mile per hour lap around an oval, autonomous lap around an oval was set. And that was kind of that first threshold that, that people wanted to see cleared, kind of like Tom Sneva breaking the 200 mile per hour barrier at Indy 500 qualifying. That box was checked and now, seeing starting with this run, we're setting new autonomous oval lap records with each run, it seems. Yeah, this is uh, really, really watching something that's uh, somewhat historic here, right? This is just, it's, it's amazing to see these teams pushing each other and the, the, it's doing exactly what they wanted to do years ago when they started this competition, is allow the competition to move the technology forward and we're seeing it right in front of us. From one European powerhouse program to another, this is TOOM out on the track here, a technical university from Munich in Germany. This is quite possibly the biggest program that's here at IMS for this event. 45 students in all, many of them PhD students working on this with some graduate students also using this as a chance to, to get involved with various projects and things towards their respective, uh, their respective degrees. They came here loaded for bear. This is a team with a lot of autonomous racing experience. Absolutely, several years of autonomous racing experience with other, through other competitions and uh, 15 PhD students, I believe they said. And that is just an unbelievable amount of brain power. 
another interesting thing about them and really the, you know, some of the other European teams is they can almost work 24-7. Uh, so they can, they can work here in, in the States and ship stuff uh, you know, over virtually and the, then the rest of the team can be working uh, back at, the, uh, at home base. That was an interesting element. Again, these teams have largely been based in Indianapolis, at least a portion of their personnel since the summer months, if not before. And so this team was telling us that the time difference actually could be an asset if used properly. Yeah, and that takes a lot of coordination though, right? That's a difficult thing to do. And uh, they, they seem to have done a, a great job getting here and, and uh, clearly are gonna show up pretty strongly here in a, in a lap. So just starting their first warm-up lap to Autonomous Motorsport on the track now. German team, this is the other team that had the spin back on Thursday and they were all smiles about it, but that very quickly could have gone the other direction and not been such a positive lesson. These are $1 million plus race cars that these universities own. Yeah, yeah, you could hear uh, Sergio talk about it earlier too, that they were a little nervous about going out first and uh, going out second probably doesn't feel too much better, but uh, they're, you know, they, 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 they saw the limits, they, they knew what the adjustments were that they needed to make, and it uh, looks like they're on a great, uh, great trajectory so far. Seem a little bit closer to the white line than uh, Poly Move was, and a, little, a slightly different line through the corners. What is that a sign of, Rob? Maybe a little bit shorter distance around the track. You know, potentially a uh, shorter distance means a lower lap time or higher average speed. And confidence in your algorithm. Yeah, absolutely. Everything looks really smooth. Both the previous car and theirs are really doing exactly what you'd expect to do and kind of staying away from the wall so you don't have any aerodynamic influence on the vehicle. On the right of the screen, Spot waving the green flag on the yard of bricks. The run has begun for two autonomous motorsport blasting into turn one. Top speeds there on the front straightaway, up over 130 miles per hour. Right now, Polymove with the fastest two-lap average, 124.450. The fastest lap was their second, a 126.725 mile per hour tour of this two and a half mile oval. Down the back stretch for the first time at speed. Here comes Tomb Autonomous Motorsport. Look like they're up above 130 miles an hour here and uh, really strong, strong through the corner as well, not slowing down as much as we saw from the previous team. Slightly lower as far as terminal velocity goes, but the drop off through the corner is not as sizable, drifting up towards the outside wall in the north end of the speedway. Then back down towards the white line at the apex of turn number four. Here comes Toom Autonomous Motorsport, the team from Munich, Germany. Onto the front straightaway, looking to put their first official lap in the books. Across the yard of bricks, that lap time for Toom. Checking in. It's like 128. 128, 447. So that provisionally moves this team to the top of the leaderboard, and they do it with a much different strategy. Not so much as far as top speed, but very consistent yeah, through the four corners. Consistent 130 miles an hour through the corners. It's uh, pretty brave, and uh, it's working out for them right now. That's about that same threshold that they reached on Thursday where they went around. Yeah, yeah, they uh, must be a little bit nervous, but you know what? The, you have to give them a lot of credit for, for sticking to the plan and, and just trusting in the data and the simulation that they probably ran all of this through and, and, uh, and, and sending it here on this lap. Can't tell you how many times we heard the phrase, we're going to send it gonna send, yeah. <laughs> over the course of chatting with teams throughout the buildup to this event. This is one team that said it, no question about it. They were undaunted by their spin on Thursday. Just set the new record for an autonomous oval lap at over 130 miles per hour the last time by. Here they come to the yard of bricks. This run is complete. And that last lap, 130.037 miles per hour. The average across the two laps, I believe, 129.237 miles per hour. Toom moves to the top of the pylon. Poly move down to second. Wow. <laughs> wow. They really did a good job there. Uh, they just, you know, kind of as expected, I think, that they were going to come out and really be strong. Uh, they overcame the spin that they, they had earlier in the week and uh, just kept on the gas and, and really showed us uh, what can happen. They had a really pretty tight line through the corners close to the white line, so they didn't run a very long distance. And 
uh, the, all the hard work they've given over the months have, has really paid off. These two teams that we just saw, they have been the pace setters consistently since the testing move from the short oval at Lucas Oil Raceway just down the road to the big track here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And they set the bar awfully high. What's your thought process now if you're one of the seven other teams that's trying to crack the top three and have a chance at the million dollar prize? Well, knowing that there are two teams that just put up really strong strong times, I think you're gonna really have to go for it and, and really program in a higher, higher average speed than that and just hope that your, your car is stable. We should note that the order was set by random draw earlier in the week. So it's simply by happenstance that the two teams that have been the fastest in the buildup go one and two in the order. But again, it should be noted, we're not done yet. Yep. This car does still need to come to a stop. I think it has. And now accelerate away and deal with the obstacle avoidance portion of the competition. Yep, they're kind of hugging the wall here. It looks like they'll probably miss the inside one. Or the first set of obstacles pretty easily. And they're going to have to make a pretty sharp maneuver to get around the second set. Look at that, right down the middle, threading the needle. Tomb Autonomous Motorsport checking that box. Now they simply need to make it back to the pits and stop adjacent to their pit stall. And those celebrations can become official. The fastest autonomous racing team in the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. One thing that should be noted there, they went through that around 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. They didn't have, they, all they had to do was not stop. So they're pretty confident in, in that uh, obstacle detection and they did uh, really a great job. And they should be. This is again, a team with previous experience racing in Robo Race, which is a road course based autonomous racing competition. And coming from that, they did say there was an adjustment going from road racing to oval racing where in their previous experience, application of brakes, they found, was the most important thing to extracting time. Here, though, it was about lateral control. Yeah, really about steering and how stable you are on the steering. I guess if you were to train a rookie how to drive here, you'd probably tell them to be really easy on the on the steering wheel and, and definitely a light on the, on the throttle, you know, no sudden movements on the throttle, especially in the corners. And so just a little bit different uh, way of driving the vehicle around this big oval because the speeds are so high. You're probably not on the brakes uh, during any normal driving during this during these laps. And so they, they really had to focus on their, their steering control and their lateral control of the vehicle. Sounds very much like the advice that the renowned oval Meister Rick Mears is known to give sure. to Indy 500 rookies coming to this place for the first time. All of these cars, of course, rookies, and making that transition from the short track at Lucas Oil Raceway, which kind of harkens back to the old days of this track, right? Where to be an Indy 500 driver, you had to race at Trenton or Langhorne or any of the, the big paved, fast, high bank tracks in order to, to qualify to be here. And there was a similar process in place going all the way back to the simulation portion of the competition. Yeah, absolutely. And then they also, you know, they had to qualify through simulation and, and uh, you, through that process, they, they learned a lot of their, uh, you know, how to write the software. They also did a lot of teaming up together and kind of learned who was strong in the different areas and, and kind of how to fill the gaps that maybe their own teams had. And, and then all, and then of course, uh, they went over uh, testing at Lucas Oil Speedway pretty endlessly over the last few months. And, uh, had to really prove themselves there to be able to step up to this level and run at IMS today. And it should be noted that all nine teams have successfully turned autonomous laps, not just at Lucas Oil Raceway, but also transitioning here to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which is a remarkable accomplishment. Again, this is a university-driven program and uh, a lot of really intelligent people working on these cars as the tomb car comes to a halt. And I think the crew can now officially celebrate their first run is complete and they find themselves in a pretty strong position looking ahead to the shootout at the end of the day. Katie? And I am joined now by Alex Wyshnevsky from... Alex, you guys talked a lot about how you had to fine-tune your algorithms for the road courses to the Oval Indianapolis Motor Speedway. How did that add an extra challenge for you? Yeah, so thank you for... Yeah, pointing that out, I think the biggest challenge in doing all of that is that we are on the road course. It's a lot about getting the right breakpoints, getting everything in. 
So, and here on the oval, it's all about lateral control. So, finding the right line, finding the right point where to steer. Because basically, everyone has seen what was happening on Thursday. And if you're a little too aggressive on the steering or don't have the right car setup, it's really easy to spin off on this track. You've had a friendly rivalry between your team and Polymove, and you are now faster than them by a couple miles an hour. What does that mean to you and your team? So for us, I think that's a big step towards the final of the competition. Let's see what the others are doing, but that was the first step. Congratulations on your successful first run. Thank you. Now they'll go back to work. They know that's achievable. They've also now seen Poly move, put up some big numbers in a straight line. And so I think already the gears are starting to turn, right? If they make it to that final three, what tweaks can we make to this software in a short amount of time in order to go even faster? Yeah, and I bet they were up pretty much all night last night running simulations, you know, especially tire modeling and the aerodynamic modeling of the vehicles, really trying to understand how fast they think that the vehicles could go uh, today. And you know, through the, the past couple of years, the, the teams that have really excelled have, have really developed very accurate simulations of, of this environment, of this vehicle, and of this track, and of Lucas Oil Speedway. If those simulations are well correlated, you can make uh, software changes much faster and with much more confidence, because really you're limited in testing time in this. Uh, you know, you have a lot of time, but even on Thursday, most cars only got out two or three times when they were running, and and so there's not there's not much on track time, and so that the simulation side of this, which you don't see, is very very important. In talking to some of the professors overseeing these programs, as we look at the black and gold team, they would be up next trying to get their program their car through the startup procedure which maybe we should touch on here before we get into anything else. Black and Gold Autonomous Racing, this is a combination involving Purdue University as well as the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, in addition to a couple of other universities from overseas, the Indian Institute of Technology, Karagpur, and the Universidad de San Buenaventura in Colombia, all working together in collaboration on this program. Just getting these cars started with so many different systems, having to work together, talking to each other, that is no mean feat. Absolutely. Uh, all of the electronics have to have to communicate and make sure that they all see each other. And it looks like maybe here they maybe got into the wall a little bit on pit lane. It's not, not easy to actually leave the pits here. Uh, it's one of these things in, in traditional racing that's pretty straightforward for a human driver. But uh, when it comes to driverless vehicles, you really have to train the vehicle to turn just right, pull out of the pits. And, uh, and hold a safe speed, and that is not as simple as it sounds. Especially at low speeds, you can have a, a kind of a hard time uh, reading all the other sensors on the vehicle. They don't maybe give you a lot of feedback, and so it can be difficult to do, uh, get out of the pits. Let's see if we can learn more from Katie. So that was really nice. And I am joined by Daniel, who is the spokesperson for Team Black and Gold. Daniel, we see your car stop just down from us. What happened? Well, um, we were telling the car, please steer right, steer right, steer right, and it was not steering right. We confirmed that the commands were being sent to the actuator. Uh, it started steering, well, not steering, and driving straight. We detected that we had a large error from where we want to be, so our safety system automatically stopped the car, no damage. Um, we're going to double check the steering actuator. So no damage is a positive here. Will you guys be able to make a successful run later today? Totally. We're well, looking forward to it, Daniel. Thank you. A lot of confidence from Daniel Gonzalez. And there is a provision in the rules that if you cannot get out of the pits within the first uh, three to five minutes, that's the allotted time, you are then moved back to the back of the line to use Indy 500 qualifying parlance. And we'll get one more shot at it later on today. So that is the case there. Which brings us to the next team to take to the track. This is Keist from South Korea. Very impressive team because, for one thing, they come in with basically no racing background, albeit a lot of autonomous driving background. However, it's just four students working on this car. <laughs> yeah, I can't say how impressive that is. It's just amazing. Uh, we, you know, great time speaking with them uh, yesterday. Uh, just the spirit that they brought into this competition and, and really the way that they look at what the future of transportation should be and, and, and it's really all about safety right and saving lives and allowing vehicles to move around more you know faster and more efficiently and it's it really really was a uh, you know this it's been a great group of a uh, great team and it's really good to see them doing pretty well here for more on their fantastic story let's go back to katie 
And Ryan, as you mentioned, they are a small but mighty team here on pit lane at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But back in South Korea, this team actually has a self-driving car that is certified to drive on the streets of South Korea. And they see this autonomous challenge really as a way to further that technology. They see the racing side of autonomous driving as a time efficient way. So they hope to take this technology back to South Korea and make those street driving cars even faster. It was a fascinating conversation that we had with this team yesterday about the philosophy that they're taking, and I think it is a unique one because, again, it comes from that background developing a car that is capable of driving on the road, not necessarily with ultimate performance in mind. And they said, we don't think of this as a car. We think of it as a robot, which is different than most of the teams up and down the pit lane. Yeah, and they're right. It is a robot. It, it uh, you know, they, they have a really strong robotics program at Keist, and, and they that's the way they, they, they approach this. And it's, it's good to see a refreshing uh, view of how to run the competition. And with, a, with such a small number of team members, you really have to uh, be really efficient with your coding. And you know how, how are you going to write the algorithm, split up the tasks very efficiently, and they uh, I don't know how they ever sleep, to be honest with you. Which leads to my favorite line of the week. We were talking to Calvin Chung, who heads up this program, and Katie, I think, asked, well, what about the time difference? How much of a challenge is that? And he said, it's not a challenge because we don't sleep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I think a lot of the teams could probably echo the same statement, and he definitely had the, the, uh, the quote of the week for sure. The car is out on the track. This is the outlap. It will go around one more time at a reduced pace. That will be the warm-up lap, and then we'll turn it loose with Spot waving the green flag. You can see the car weaving side to side a little bit down the back straightaway. And, Rob, this is something from the world of, of typical driver based racing that we see that some of these teams are starting to incorporate given the ambient temperatures, they're quite low. Building tire temperature, building tire pressure, that's something that a racing driver would do. And now, these autonomous cars weaving back and forth trying to accomplish the same thing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. They're intentionally doing this weave process right here to try to, to put some slip into the tires to try to, to, to warm them up. The warmer the, the tires get, the more grip that they make. So this is a kind of a nerve-wracking thing to watch, to be honest with you, because it's quite difficult to do this. And so they practiced it uh, pretty well. and. Uh, you can see they're doing a good job of it. They're up above uh, 55 miles an hour here, so it's uh, it's really uh, about a, a traditional pace speed that you might see in a in a in a traditional race. So. Yep, speed starting to come up. When they first left the pit lane, it was down around 25, 30 miles per hour. Now up to 55 miles per hour through turn number four. Keist stands for the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And they have been hard at work with some of the domestic manufacturers in South Korea building these cars for the road. And one common refrain talking to the people developing this technology as to down the road why racing might be the ideal platform to push this technology is the uncertainty that you experience driving on the road is something that is amplified in a racing environment. And if a car can learn to handle that at speed, Surely they can handle driving through the city streets. Absolutely, we call them edge cases, and on the you know on the city streets, maybe you don't encounter them very often, but in racing, you're going to encounter them every lap, pretty much all the time. And you think about you know at high speeds, different vehicles moving around in front of you, you're going to have to plan where they're going and try to figure out how to avoid them while still taking an optimal line. So this is a, a really uh, critical part about the future of of this of this series and kind of where it's going and and the technologies that can help. Uh, that, that can be developed to help our passenger cars today to help them become safer. Which leads to a frequently asked question about where this is headed. <laughs> and the answer I keep getting, because I've been asking this a lot, is these are a million dollar plus cars. It would be a shame to see them run only once. Yeah, I think uh, everybody really wants to see them see them keep going and uh, hopefully there'll be some good announcements coming in the near future on that and, and certainly with the level of investment that they put into this uh, it'd be a shame to see it to see it stop and I know the universities are definitely uh, as I think we heard earlier in one of the videos you know once you sort of get hooked in one of these competitions you stop sleeping and uh, you know they're hooked at this point and and uh, the algorithms are really getting a lot stronger speaking with the teams this week they've really done a uh, a wonderful job of developing algorithms that could go to head-to-head to -head racing. 
Calvin Chung, the team lead, he's sitting in the center of that shot, watching the car start to build the speed, and it is coming yep. up, approaching triple digits now at the end of the back straightaway, over 90 miles per hour. Yes, it's not easy, and they're holding a good line, uh, pretty, you know, about a car length off the white line at the bottom of the track. Slowed down a little bit through the corners and uh, into the high 70s, and uh, back up on the short shoot at a little bit higher speed. Looking, looking really strong. And look at the racing line utilized yep. there. That is very similar textbook to what you'd see a professional racing driver do. And again, many of these teams kind of thinking about some of those aspects of this challenge for the first time as they've hit the track for real, moving away from the simulator. No, you see, you, it's uh, exactly what the, the project was intended to, or the program was intended to do. The first of two timed laps is complete. 82.037 miles per hour. That would be third quickest of the three cars that have taken to the track so far. This is the second time lap. And again, it is the average of these three laps running a bit high on entry through turn two, but much smoother than the last time. We should see a big jump in performance if the north end of the track can uh, be anything like the south. Absolutely. Uh 95 miles an hour now, definitely through the corner much faster than, than the previous lap, so they're looking really strong. Down the back straightaway, five-eighths of a mile at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Speeds now up to 96 miles per hour. Hasn't quite pushed the needle past the 97.1. We saw coming to turn one for the first time. Yeah, you can hear him back out of the throttle a little bit in the corner and uh, just make sure they were in it within the traction envelope that they feel like they have, and they're they're uh, really coming home, doing a great job. Talk about confidence, and just like a human driver coming here for the first time, the software has to build confidence. Yeah, and that's a really difficult thing to do because uh, you know you, you, you have limited track time, just as in traditional racing, you know, limited practice time, limited track time, and so this is really where that that software, the simulation rounds. Uh, of this series came in, to, came in to help these teams so that they could try out different algorithms and uh, build confidence as they go. Kais to cross the yard of Briggs. Their two lap run is complete. The last lap was 86.8 miles per hour. The average speed 84.355 miles per hour. Third fastest of the three, so that puts them on the bubble to move on to the shootout reserved for the top three speeds from round one of competition. The format for round two is slightly different. The teams will be given four warm-up laps in the build-up to a two-lap sprint. Those two laps will again be averaged, as we see here in round one, and there will be no obstacle avoidance portion. That is simply about the speed as the KAIST team monitors the data in real time, and it's amazing how much information comes off of these cars any given second. Ice simply has to make it around the track one more time, pit adjacent to their box, and it's mission accomplished for this small but mighty Korean team. Yeah, and you know, 84 miles an hour is not slow. No. Uh, it's faster than we all drive on the expressway, and so it's really a, a good time that they put up if you think about it, and, and uh, you know, very difficult challenge, and especially with the size of the team they have. I couldn't be more impressed with how they, how they just did. And uh, they may very well make it into the final round with that run. And this is, again, a smaller team with limited resources. Losing track time for them through the course of the week probably was more costly than it would have been for some of the bigger operations. Yeah, definitely. And we rain, you know, Mother Nature rained us out yesterday. And we're really looking forward to, to trying out all their final tweaks. And the thing that you start to run into as you run out of time is, you know, you don't have time to validate any new software algorithms. So you're kind of stuck. And when that rain out happened yesterday, it made a lot of people pretty nervous that we're trying to catch up to the top teams. And uh, so certainly they, uh, you know, it wasn't, it was pretty unfortunate to see the rain yesterday. Let's take a moment to chat about this car again. This is based on the Dallara IL-15 Indy Lights chassis, but rebadged the IAC Dallara AV-21 because it comes with some very unique technology, slightly different power plant with a four-cylinder turbocharged engine, a two-liter uh, inline four with a single turbo on this engine which has proven to be more than capable of handling the demands that uh, that these teams have placed on the car. Yeah, absolutely. It's a 385 horsepower, four-cylinder engine, 
uh, really does everything that they need. And from an autonomy point of view, it was really important that the the, the throttle command or the you know the gas pedal would be all all uh, uh, electronically driven, right? So and then also we wanted to automate the gear shifts. So we didn't want the teams to have to deal with what they needed to do with the engine during a gear shift. And so the engine controller itself will actually uh, sort of what we call throttle blips. It'll blip the throttle every time it does a gear change. It does that automatically so that the teams only have to request a, you know, a, a gear shift or we say when to shift and then the, the, the vehicle figures out how to make that shift so it sort of takes over in that moment. And you hear that when their vehicles are running around and they make a gear shift, the engine actually does a quick uh, movement to make sure that happens. And then another interesting thing about the powertrain is it has a special clutch in it that uh, is centrifugal so that the, the teams don't have to figure out how to sort of dump a clutch pedal in a manual vehicle. It's a very difficult thing to do. And so it's really just engine RPM based as the engine RPM comes up to about uh, 1500 or so, the clutches start to lock up. And then uh, maybe about 300 RPM later, they're locked. And it, it really allows them to do these nice smooth launches that you see. And uh, it, you know, additionally on the engine, we wanted to make sure that it idled at a very low speed because um, you want to do what we call a virtual track walk or a real track walk. You know, in traditional driving, uh, racing, the drivers and the teams will go out and walk the track and talk about all the details. In driverless racing, you really need to be able to map the surface with the same sensors you're going to race with, uh, similar to a track walk. And so uh, we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that the engine could, could run uh, at low engine speed so that we could drive the vehicle as a, at as low a speed as possible. And that's not something you traditionally think about in racing, right? Let's make the car both fast and slow at the same time. And it was a, a pretty difficult challenge, but I, th I think it's been achieved. You can see they're rolling, they were rolling around, uh, uh, you know, around like 20 miles an hour earlier, and that uh, it's worked out quite well. It looks like Cavalier is out on the course. Yes, indeed. Cavalier Autonomous Racing. This is the KAIST team coming to a stop right by their pit box. So mission accomplished there. Their time now officially registered as the third fastest of three. This UVA team comes in with a lot of experience at the helm because the uh, gentleman who oversees this program, he has been participating in autonomous racing for a long time. More on that story in a moment, but first down to Katie to hear from Keist. And I'm with Calvin Chung, one of just four members, as we mentioned, of Team Keist. And Calvin, Yay! the smile on your face. You have the most emotion of any Woo! team so far. I mean, it, it, today, <clears throat> through emotion. <laughs> I mean, for our team, it is a big day. Actually, this is the, our best record ever, like from end of the May. So, and also, the car is still in a single piece, right? So it's, I mean, we are super successful today. I'm mean, very excited and I'm so happy. I cannot explain more, more than this. The focus of your research back in South Korea thus far has been autonomous cars in an urban environment. What did you learn here at the Indy Autonomous Challenge that you can take back to that urban environment? So, so we are not taking this car, uh, not a car, we are taking this as a robot actually. So basically there's a, the, the, main principle is the same in, in our perspective. So like a pass planning and a control or perception we use. I mean, we bring the base technology from there a lot and then we apply here. So yeah, that's it. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much. Pretty amazing story. The fastest they have gone through this entire process was there in that run. Kais, the third fastest of the three teams, but so much to be proud of. Oh, absolutely. They just, uh, they really did it. They, they, they beat what they uh, expected they could do. It's exactly what you wanted to see out of them. They've really been a solid team all along. Even when the when everything started out, they, they really stepped in to help hand over the vehicles and learn them and uh, been just an outstanding team to have as part of this competition. As mentioned, Cavalier Autonomous Racing, their team lead, a professor at UVA, Madhur Bale, who 10 years ago, came up with the idea for racing one-tenth scale autonomous cars. He called it F1 tenth, as he's a huge Formula One fan, and it has taken off. And he said, at that time, my dream was this, what you're seeing here, full-scale autonomous race cars on real-world racetracks, and his UVA program has managed to do exactly that. 
Yeah, and Modder has a lot of great energy. Yeah, I mean, to be a great person to work for, I just really, really um, happy to see him here. And it's also interesting to see that a lot of the other teams have competed in his F110 competitions. Yeah, a lot of these up and down the grid have experience with that. Certainly, some of the European teams have been competitors against him at various times as the Cavalier team is on it, headed down to turn number one, their first timed lap at the Indy Autonomous Challenge. What does the warm-up lap look like? Well, they hit a max speed of 123 miles an hour, so they are really going well right now. This is really looking strong. Very strong indeed. 123.404 was the top speed set on that warm-up lap and looking pretty sporty through the south end of the racetrack. Absolutely. Hit right down on the white line, right on the line that they wanted to be on. This is where it all started for Mater, who we were talking about earlier, his first autonomous race car for F110, and he brought it here. This is the mascot for the Cavaliers this weekend. What a cool story, and you cannot wipe the smile off his face, and he's certainly not unique in that sentiment. Absolutely, and his car is, is looking outstanding on the track. Uh, up over 120 miles an hour again through the corners. Really, really looking strong. This is maybe a team that has been under the radar throughout the course of the week, but looking competitive right now. They need to beat Keist's time to make it into the top three, which will advance on to the shootout at the end of the day to the Art of Bricks. There's the white flag waved by Spot, and the first timed lap comes out to 119.834 miles per hour. That would provisionally be fast enough to make the top three. Cavalier Autonomous Racing, though, with still two miles left on their first run. And I think something really clicked for this team on Thursday. They just really seemed to kind of relax and get into, into, into the right pace, and all of a sudden their speed's picked way up. And, and today they, they really said they were going to try to go after something special and set their own personal records as the fastest they've ever gone, and I think they're two in it right now. Madra told me that his goal for this event was to affect the public perception of autonomous driving. If these cars can drive on their own around a racetrack in conditions like these at up over 100 miles per hour, what then can an autonomous car do on the road? And clearly we're seeing something that is very much at the forefront of a new developing technology. Here comes Cavalier Autonomous Racing onto the front straightaway, accelerating out of turn number four, up over 120 miles per hour. The first lap at a shade under 119 on average. The second time by that speed, 119.933 miles per hour. The average speed, 119.883 miles, miles per hour, provisionally good enough for third. Really did outstanding there. It looks like they're going to come around and uh, stop and do the obstacle avoidance. Really took a good line around the track and really low down in the corners and uh, ran the shortest distance they could. And I think it paid off for them in a, in a, in a top three speed here. So this is, uh, looks like we may be seeing them this afternoon a little bit later. And keep in mind, this is very much a race into the unknown for these teams because after the two spins on Thursday, Oh, we got some reports of precipitation in the pit lane, so some of the covers come over the race cars. Might have been an interesting moment there for this team if they were feeling raindrops while it was out on track and they kept the pedal down. Yeah, absolutely. These uh, hot, slick tires did definitely do not like the rain. Um, so, yeah, I think... Uh, We'll see if they abort this or not, or if they're going to keep going through the obstacle detection. I'm not sure. We'll have to keep an eye on that. But back to the story, the organizers effectively mandated some changes in setup. And barring a very brief practice window this morning, which very few teams were able to get out on track for, no one really has turned laps with these cars in these configurations. Right, exactly. What they found on the two crashes, are that are the two spins really that happened, oh, it looks like they're coming through. The two spins is that they, the cars were, were heavy into oversteer or the tail end of the car stepped out. And so they, the organizers got together and spoke with all the technical experts uh, at Delara and, and the race teams and uh, I decided to add a little bit more rear downforce into the vehicles to keep them stuck to the track and hopefully allow them to, to get through the corners a little bit faster and push that limit even further, but nobody knows what that limit is at this point. 
So now for the obstacle avoidance portion of the run, which is not timed, it's simply pass or fail through past the initial set of obstacles without trouble, able to avoid the second one without any drama as well. And so now Cavalier Autonomous Racing can celebrate. They just need to make it back to the pits and park. And their job is done right now, fast enough to make it into the shootout. Yeah, they did. A, uh, the the obstacle avoidance was really good there, and it was kind of interesting to see. They made the they made it sort of an S turn, but they didn't try to go back to the center of the track. They just kind of kept the car close to the pit wall and, and moved on. So that was a, a really good plan, I think, on their part to not try to overdo it and potentially spin the car, trying to recorrect back onto the optimal race line. Great job by them. When we see the car headed into obstacle avoidance, what sensors are the teams really utilizing? to clear that portion of the challenge. Sure, the, it's going to be a combination of the, uh, at least for, for now, what they've been using are the either the radars or the radars and the LIDARs. It seems like most of the teams have leaned toward uh, using the LIDARs um, you, you know, to, to really identify exactly where the obstacle is, although the radars are also capable. So there's kind of a combination through the garage area of, of who is using what. Um, although I think the best strategy, and it, which also seems like several of the teams are using, is kind of fusing those, those sensors together or using the data streams together just to make sure that you have confidence in those location um, of those obstacles on both. So if they're both agreeing with each other, that's great. Then you have really high confidence you know where these obstacles are. Is that what the teams are talking about when they're talking about redundancy? Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you bring in this information, you perceive this information from multiple locations. You could also use it with the camera as well. But one of the things that's kind of interesting, the teams, um, they, they were training AI, AI algorithms uh, to do image processing around Indy cars and looking for other cars, right? Other AV21 cars out on the track. And, and uh, recently they went to, to this strategy where we're going to put these obstacles out there and they look very different than indie cars and so uh, it, pr it probably meant a lot of their their camera software you know the ai software that they wrote for their cameras wasn't really ready for this although uh, they did do a bunch of practice runs over the past few days so it's certainly possible that the teams went home and, and uh, took all the, the camera record the recorded camera data that they that they have and started training new algorithms based on these obstacles so they're also very reliable sensors to use in this application Hopefully the precipitation is light. We did see in the forecast a chance for some scattered rain showers. Of course, anyone who's familiar with racing here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is aware that uh, rain on the racetrack on the oval is not a good thing. And speaking of not a good thing, this car should have been making its way down the pit lane, Rob. Yeah, um, they may have. So the way that they bring the cars into pit lane uh, race control issues a, a black flag to the car, and that tells it to go on a path where it's going to hit into the pit lane. And it may very well have happened here that they received that, that flag a little late or, or they didn't obey it for some reason. Maybe they didn't feel like it was safe to actually pit that time around. Uh, I'm not exactly sure here, but that may very well have been what happened. You even have to do this in traditional racing. If your team asks you to come in and pit and you're too close to the entrance of pit lane, you really have to go around another time. That's probably what happened in this case. Now, my question to you, and you may or may not know this answer, so apologies in advance if I'm putting you on the spot. If it is determined that the black flag was issued at the appropriate time, does this constitute a failure to complete the challenge of coming to the pit lane and stopping by the pit box? Boy, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I can I can read that anyway. They say they say you just have to make a safe stop adjacent to your pit box. Maybe I'm not sure if it's written in the rules that you have to do it exactly on that lap or not. So it'll be interesting to see the debate that will go on around this. Uh, but I think as long as they come in and pit, I would I would guess they'll be okay. But this is. Uh, uh, really will be uh, kind of finally reading the rules and trying to understand it almost as a lawyer here to see to see what happens because they put an awesome uh, lap time up on the board. This is an interesting mix on this program of faculty as well as students from the University of Virginia and again Modder Bell who heads up this team. He's been dreaming of this day for a very very long time. An update on Cavalier Autonomous Racing now with Katie. And Ryan, I was just listening to Madur and some of his teammates with Cavalier Autonomous Racing trying to figure out what happened with the car and some of the team members mentioned, well, I think the car just switched to cool down lap mode instead of coming to pit lane mode. So Rob, what's the difference in those two algorithms? 
Yeah, the pit lane mode basically redirects it through the GPS systems. It says, okay, follow a different path. And so cool down mode is really just kind of slow down like you traditionally do when a caution flag comes out and run the, you know, run still the traditional race line, but a, but a pit mode will say, okay, I need to run a different line or my target line is a different line, which is going to be entering the pit lane through the exit, you know, at the exit of turn four. So it's just a difference in lines that they were, that they were commanding. So we'll see if they come in here. A lot of eyes on this race car, which stays to go. the right, but yep. now starting to come back to the pit lane entry. That is good news, and now we'll leave it to race control to determine whether or not this checks all the appropriate boxes. But great speed out of this team, which checked in third fastest of the four that have set times here so far, but a big jump for them, kind of like we saw from Keist achieving speeds that we had not seen from them previously. Yeah, it's race day and there's a big check at the end of it. So they're def definitely doing what, what you'd expect here. It's been, you know, they, they've, they've really ramped up over the last few weeks as, as the, the algorithms have become uh, uh, better and better and improved. You could see this car was incredibly stable when it went around the track. It never had a moment where you were concerned at all. It was, it was always tracking the line it wanted uh, pretty much exactly. And when you get to that point, really the main thing there is just how much risk do you want to take? You just keep bumping up the speeds until potentially you get back to those control issues. So it's just a slow progression of, of steps and, and they're really in that mode now where they're in this, this pretty rapid speed up as uh, things are looking really stable. The car has come to a stop and Katie has more. And I think there is now some relief here at Cavalier Autonomous Racing. Let's check in with Maduro real quick. What happened on that lap where your car was supposed to come to the pits? That's right. So uh, we were on our cool down lap because the previous lap was pretty fast. And uh, we didn't slow down enough to make that safe maneuver into the pit. So the car decided to slow down using one more lap. Yeah. But then it came and stopped automatically. Still a successful run for Cavalier Autonomous Racing, and in your hands now is the F110 car that you created. When we spoke earlier this week, you talked about this being the realization of a dream. How much relief are you now feeling seeing that car parked here on pit lane? Yeah, I'll be honest, I, I was a little anxious because uh, we were really pushing today, and you know the track is a little bit cold as well, so uh, we are happy with our run. It went really fast, and yes, you are right. You know This is absolutely where it started. And then behind me is the, the full-scale Indy autonomous race car. It doesn't get any better than this. Yep. On Thursday during practice, your team made a lot of improvements. What did you find? Yeah, it's all about, you know, like a, a race car is never a finished product. You never come to race day and say, okay, we are all set. Nothing will go wrong. There's always room to improve. I can go back and make improvements right now. So we had, you know, we were trying different race lines, different aggressive lines, so we had to try them out. Uh, we tried obstacle avoidance, improving that, which worked really perfectly today. So it's all about, you know, analyzing the data and making these small, very surgical improvements to a software. And uh, it, in the last week, in the last few days, it has all come together for us and given us the confidence to push our car today. Speaking of taking next steps, you've got F110 car, the Indy Autonomous Challenge car just over pit wall here. What's next for the University of Virginia? What's next for the university? And I think what's next for autonomous racing is really to keep pushing, right? This is the beginning of something really exciting. I can assure you, you will have multiple cars racing each other, just like in Indy 500. And my personal ambition is in three to five years time, I'm going to challenge the winner of the Indy 500 for a head-to-head -head race and see what happens. What a sight that would be, right, Ryan and Rob? My goodness, the gauntlet has been thrown down, and what a huge statement that is about the confidence in this technology and the future it has. Yeah, and you know what? He's, uh, you know, he's, he's a super inspirational person to thousands of students, right? And uh, it's great to hear him say that, you know, because he, he really does believe in this, and, and uh, he may very well be right. I wouldn't count him out.